All right. So, we've been given the green light to get started. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks for staying for the last session of the day. I hope it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for being here. So um, in the next 60 minutes or so, I'm going to be, going to be talking about building a real-world application, uh, cross-platform, of course, with Xamarin and MVVM. So we're going to focus on an architecture which is heavily relying on the MVVM cross framework. And I'm going to try to talk for 60 minutes. I have quite a bad cold, so it's going to be uh, very tight to see if we get that 60 minutes or not. So let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is uh, Gilles Clair and I'm coming from Belgium, uh, where I work at a company called uh, Ordina. And I focus mostly on the, uh, on the, the mobile projects there that we uh, mostly tend to do uh, with uh, Xamarin. If you have any questions about this talk, feel free to send me an email, send me a tweet, or check my website at snowball.be, and I'll be happy to, uh, to help you with any questions you may have. Um, the good news for you is also we only have about 60 minutes together. Um, I'm also a Pluralsight author, and there is actually a five-hour version of this um, that actually goes a lot deeper in many of the details of the application that I'm going to sh be, uh, be showing here today. So if you want to check that out, uh, check out my uh, courses on Pluralsight. I have the link here, but simply go to Pluralsight, search for my name, and you'll find it as a Xamarin MVVM course uh, up there as well. So what are we going to be doing today? It's actually quite a filled agenda, so uh, I have to make sure that I don't lose too much time here. Um, we'll start with a very high-level overview of some of the concepts that I do think uh, you have to grasp. I hope many of you already do, but I'm going to give them to you anyway to make sure that no one uh, goes overboard. I'm going to show you first the final application, some of the concepts such as what is MVVM, such as data binding, and I'm also going to give you a brief introduction on the MVVM cross framework. That will take us about 15 to 20 minutes, and after that, <coughs> I'm going to focus on the meat of the application. So I'm going to show you the full architecture. We're going to see what we can share, how I've reached the, the level of code sharing in my application that I've done here. I'm going to show it the Android app. I have my PC with me, so it's a bit hard to run an iOS app on there as well. So I'm going to focus on the Android part. As mentioned, there is a Pluralsight course where I also show how the iOS specifics uh, are built. And uh, if we have time, hopefully we'll look at plugins and uh, as well at unit testing this uh, whole setup. Now, before we actually continue, uh, let me give you a, a very quick look at the application. So the application is called My Trains. It's an imaginary uh, train company or train um, uh, application that allows you to book uh, via the mobile app uh, tickets for train journeys. So you can search journeys, you can then view the journey details, save it to your uh, collection of, of journeys, and then there's a couple of settings. As mentioned, it's fully based on uh, the MVVM cross framework, and it works both on iOS and Android. So what I'm going to do here as the first thing is I'm going to show you the uh, application running here in the MLA. It has a splash screen. We'll see later how that's built. This is the, uh, this is the search journeys screen from where I can search a journey. Uh, I can select a city here I want to go to on this particular day. I can select the time, let's say 9 a.m., and then hit the search button. Then I arrive here on this search results uh, page from where I can click on one of the uh, journeys. I see the details of this uh, journey that I've selected. I also am able to uh, enter here the amount of tickets I want to order. I can add it to my saved journeys. It's giving me a dialogue and when I hit the close button, it's automatically popping that screen again of the stack, and I arrive back here in the search results screen. Uh, I also have a hamburger icon that opens a uh, menu here on the left from where I can uh, jump to other pages, such as the My Saved Journeys, which is a, a page which is very similar to the one that is showing the results, uh, that is uh, including the one that I've just added somewhere at the bottom, I think. It is, by the way, sample data. I'll show that uh, later on. And then I can also here go to the settings page for where I can uh, change the uh, currency within the application as well as go to the website of the creator of this application, which in this case is my own website. So that's the entire application. Um, it's actually a, a, a trimmed down version uh, of, um, I, and actually based on an architecture, let's say, of applications that we've been doing for customers for quite some time now already. So it's actually an architecture which has proven itself in quite a few real life or real world projects. So I hope this is interesting for you. Um, 
The code uh, is available uh, via GitHub um, or also via Pluralsight. You can also download it. So this includes all the screens, uh, both for iOS and Android, and the full architecture of this application. So simply go to my GitHub and you can download the code from there. All right. Without further ado, let me first give you a couple of the concepts that uh, are lying behind this architecture. That, as mentioned, this is going to take us about 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to take a look at the code. So, of course, this application, like I said, is built uh, on, uh, on the MVVM. Now, the model view view model pattern is all about, or is actually based on the fact that we have data binding. Now, data binding for the people, I think by now everyone knows data binding, but still there's a couple of people who never know what data binding is. So data binding is just an infrastructure that allows us to link data uh, that is living in objects with, uh, with the UI element. So we can link the first name property of a, a user object to the text, label, text property of a label. Now, a data binding is always made up out of four components. Uh, if you look on this slide here, on the left we have the UI element that has a UI property that we are going to bind to, and on, this, on the right here we have the binding source, that's my data, my in-memory data, that is going to be the source for the binding. As mentioned, the data binding always needs these four elements, those four building blocks to actually work. So the binding object, the binding source object and a property, and on the binding target side, a UI element with a UI property. Data binding sits in between and makes sure that the data from the source is flowing, uh, floating to the target uh, there on the left. You also see that the arrows are bidirectional, meaning that we can also enter data there in the UI, like I've done with the amount of tickets in the demo that we've just seen, and then that data will also be uh, sent back, and data binding can also do that for us. Now, the data binding uh, in general also can do other things. It can also, for example, apply a conversion on the data. For example, if we have a date, which is coming from a database somewhere here, and it's fully unformatted and we want to display it in the UI, we can also ask the data binding engine through converters to convert the date into a more readable form. Format. Data binding is a bi-directional thing and can also make sure that the data remains in sync. Synchronization is a very important feature of data binding as well. If the data changes here, it will automatically be updated there in the UI. Also in the other direction, if I change the data in the UI, I can make it so that the data binding engine automatically updates my source. This, this flowing and this automatic synchronization of data only works if I have a couple of conditions, which I'll come to later on. Now, very often, and like we had, for example, in the application that I've shown you, we have a lot of fields on the UI. Is there a problem? Okay, there's a problem with the microphone. Okay, are we good? Yep. All right, thanks. So, um, where was I? Ah. Um, now, in many applications, we will have screens like this. I imagine this is that journey detail screen. I will have a lot of uh, elements that actually are binding to the same source. In most, most of the time when we use data binding, we are going to actually bind a number of fields to the same source. In that area, we talk about the data context. We set the entire screen linked to one source object, and then all the fields within here can actually bind to that single object that we are binding to. And that object is often referred to as the data context. Just keep that in mind. We'll see it later when we look at the code in the second part of this uh, presentation here. Now, we can bind to single objects. Have you seen me data bind, and you've seen actually in the application that I could uh, show the journey details screen. There I was binding to a single journey, but I could also data bind to a list of journeys. When I had the search results screen, for example, there was a list of items being shown. Data binding can allow us to bind both to single objects as well as collections. Now, Already jumping a bit ahead, when we look at um, Xamarin, and in this presentation I'm going to focus solely on, uh, on, on the classic Xamarin, the traditional Xamarin, so not Xamarin forms, um, when we want to do data binding, and I prefer to do data binding in MVVM in all applications that are built, when we look at classic Xamarin, well, there is basically no support out of the box for data binding. Now, the good thing is that the creators of MVVM Cross have enabled uh, both Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android to uh, allow us to do data binding in the UI. What you see here is actually a piece of Android XML 
that is coming, that is typically living in a Xamarin Android application, where I am actually doing uh, data binding. If you think about it, well, this is my UI element that I'm going to be binding to, a text view, and I'm going to use something that is called MVX bind. Now, MVX, we'll see that popping up quite a few times, is actually the uh, one of the classes, uh, all the classes at MVM, because start with MVX. So this is actually something that is coming, that is added uh, with MVVM cross. And it is doing a data binding so that the text property of this text view is going to bind, in this case, to a journey date. So through MVVM cross, we are now capable of data binding to uh, this journey date declaratively in Android XML. Out of the box, it's not possible with Xamarin Android. Now, Xamarin iOS is a difficult, uh, is, is actually a different thing. Now, you have perhaps, uh, for example, storyboards that you can use, but you shouldn't be editing storyboards uh, plainly in the XML. That is going to cause a lot of issues. So you can't uh, declaratively create data bindings in Xamarin iOS. However, the creators of MVVM Cross did, however, make it possible to do data bindings, in this case, in code behind, let's say. So in is in C sharp code in the controller will have to write some code uh, that you see here. We are actually also creating a data binding between this view and an object which is going to be a view model. Don't worry about view models just yet. I'm just showing the concept of data binding here. And then I'm going to also create a binding between a UI element and an object that I'm using as the bindings source. So this becomes possible because of the fact that I'm using MVVM cross. Now, what I also showed you, what I also explained to you, is that data binding is capable of uh, making sure that the data source and the data target remain in sync. There is automatic synchronization of data possible. Only, however, if the object for the binding, the object source for the binding, is actually expo or implementing an interface called the iNotify property changed interface. It's a very common interface nowadays in .NET. It's a very simple interface as well. If you simply have, if you implement it here, this uh, event here at the bottom needs to be uh, in your class as well. What you also need to do is when the value of the property changes, you need to raise that event. And automatically, in plain, um, uh, plain XAML, in, in plain WPF, for example, we automatically, uh, <coughs> Through data binding, the UI remains in sync with the source. And here, through MVVM Cross, it will also be possible to get automatic synchronization. And this relieves us from having to write code that says, well, if something changes, then the text property of this particular label should be updated. That is very error-prone code. We want to avoid that. Data binding does it for us. And in the case of MVVM Cross, the MVVM Cross framework uh, gives us this support as well. Now, also with data binding, data can flow in different directions. I've already mentioned that. So by default, it will flow from the source to the target. There's actually two uh, options that we get there. It can float one way or one time. One time means that only initially the data will go from the source to the target. Whereas if the data source changes and the UI will be updated, we need to specify the binding to be a one-way binding. And when the source then changes, the UI will be up updated as well. If we, however, implement this iNotify property changed. It is also possible to actually uh, create a two-way binding. Like I've done with entering the amount of tickets I wanted in the demo, I can specify that binding to be a two-way binding, meaning that the data will also flow from the source to the target. Sorry, from the target to the source. And the one-way to source is basically a data binding that only allows me to enter data in the UI and let that flow back to the data binding source. To do that in code, if you know XAML, well, you see that uh, creating this or uh, specifying the mode here on the binding is actually done in a declarative way in Xamarin Android as well. I can simply specify the mode here to be two-way and my UI will also update here. And the last thing here, I think, is the converters. Like I've already mentioned, it is possible to actually uh, invoke or, let's say, create a hook in the data binding process. It is possible for me to convert the value when going from the source to the target. Typically, we do that in XAML with converters. And in Xamarin, uh, in uh, MVVM Cross, with, uh, in uh, Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, we also get the ability to convert the value when going from the source to the target. And that is done through a class which has to inherit from MVX value converter. Again, the class starts with MVX, meaning that this is indeed going to be a class that is coming from MVVM cross. 
It, has, it uh, accepts two type parameters, the daytime and the string in this case, meaning that it is going to convert from daytime into string, and in this case, it's going to return me the formatted string. Now, if you see the class here, define daytime to day converter, when I use it in my data bindings in Xamarin uh, and uh, Xamarin, um, are we having problems again? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it's not my voice that is the, okay. Can you hear me again? All right. So when we call this clause daytime to day converter, we actually can invoke that converter to be used by specifying on my data binding statement converter equals date time today. So we have to leave off the converter. We'll see that again later when we look at the code. Just keep in mind that through MVVM cross, it becomes possible to actually create conversions on our data bindings. Now, that is data binding. Data binding is actually the enabler for the MVVM pattern or the view model pattern. Again, out of the box, uh, M Xamarin Forms has support for MVVM, but out of the box, uh, classic Xamarin, so traditional Xamarin iOS and Xamarin uh, Android do not. So that is why we are going to see how we can do that in uh, MVVM Cross. Now, for the people who have never heard about MVVM, MVVM is actually just a pattern. It's called the model view view model pattern. It's actually a variation of the MVC pattern, which basically lives because of data binding and commanding. We'll see that uh, when we look at the code in just uh, a couple of minutes. It became very popular, was actually invented uh, with, the, with, with XAML. It uh, became very popular at the time of Silverlight, which is also when I started building my applications based on this pattern. Now, what MVVM does is basically making it making possible that we are going to be able to build code which is much more testable and both maintainable as well. So typically what we have, what we write, is coding code behind. And code behind, out of the box, is code that is doing everything. It is going to the model and it will then update the UI and try testing that type of code. It's going to be very hard because all of the code is just one monolithic block. That's what we want to avoid. Now, with MVVM, that becomes possible. What we can do with MVVM is actually still create the same view code and a very little tiny bit of code behind uh, in, in general. And that code behind is actually going to only do UI-related stuff. But all the interactions with the model are going to be handled by a separate class here, and that's the view model. The view model can be seen, well, as an abstraction of the view. Typically, what in the view model will have is um, state and operations. State is basically data, uh, a property that we are going to be binding on, an object that we are going to be using uh, to expose data to the UI. That is state. Typically, it's exposed as a property. So in our case, that could be, for example, the journey details. Uh, it will select the journey is a property on, or an object that I'm going to be binding on. That is state. Operations are commands. And I'll show you commands when we look at the code. And that is basically available in my view model. Now, my view is actually going to be binding through data binding, of course, onto that view model. And that view model has interactions with the model. It will go out, get data, and when it has changed, it will raise a notification, and then the view, which is data bound onto the view model, will know about the change, and it will automatically update. And that's how the circle is basically uh, created here. <coughs> Sorry. Now, how, do we, uh, how should you envision such a view model? Well, it's actually simply a class. Now, in MVVM cross, and we'll see that happening when we look at the demo, in MVVM cross, our view models need to inherit from a base view model that comes with the framework. In fact, MVVM cross will search your assembly for all classes that, impl oh, sorry, that inherit from the MVX view model base class. That's what you see here. Um, in there, I'm exposing two things, like I said. And select the journey is a property that is going to expose state on my journey detail view model. And that was the one uh, where we could see the details of the journey. And the select the journey is just state that my UI is going to be binding on. When I hit, for example, the close button, I'm not going to invoke code in the code behind. On the contrary, I'm actually going to invoke code here that lives inside my view model. And that is exposed through a command. Again, that command is of type MVX command, a built-in command that comes with the MVVM cross framework. 
And I've mentioned it quite a few times already, for this application and for this architecture, I'm using MVVM Cross. It is an open source framework, it has been around for quite some years already, and it of course uh, enables us to build Xamarin applications, classic Xamarin applications, with uh, MVVM. It's an open source framework, uh, can get the code on GitHub, um, and it, um, it actually promotes code sharing to a level which is not possible out of the box without MVVM. Cross. We'll see that when we look at the code. It's also available for many platforms, of course, Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android. It also has support for WPF, for example. It also supports Xamarin Forms, but, well, in Xamarin Forms, I've not uh, actually made use of, uh, of the uh, MVVM Cross Framework. Uh, the, the, the creators have advised against it, and they said, well, they are rewriting Xamarin, uh, MVVM Cross to create better support for uh, MVVM Cross. Now, what does the framework come with? Well, like I've already uh, emphasized here, there's data binding. It enables data binding uh, for classic Xamarin applications, which we do not get out of the box. It also is built around IOC, so a version of control. There's actually uh, an IOC container as well as a service locator in the framework available. And I'm going to use that as well. So the framework itself uses it, and we can actually hook into it to be using it in our applications as well. And there's also rich support for plugin. That's an extension point uh, of the framework. If we have time, I'll show you a couple of plugins uh, in the application. Again, you can take a look at it afterwards as well. So these are the basic concepts that I wanted to explain to you before we actually look at the application architecture. I hope uh, that gives you some background to follow along with the rest of the talk. All right, let's do this. So let's now take a look at the application architecture. Now, the application architecture really isn't all that special. Huh? If you take a look at the layers that I've used for this application, well, there's really nothing uh, uh, spectacular going on. Huh? The application typically will talk with a remote service that could be a web API and some REST uh, backend that we are going to be communicating with. That's the remote service. In this application, in the code, you can actually find the generic... Um, uh, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, there is actually no um, communication with a real service, but it's very easy to plug in, of course. Um, the actual application side, so everything above this line here, is actually what is in the application. So at the very bottom of the layers, we have a repository layer. That is actually my layer which is going to do the communication with the backend. In typical real applications, I also put my caching here. So I will first check the cache if there is a, a local version which is still valid. If not, I will go out to the service, store that version in the cache again, and then return it to the upper layers, to the consumer layers. Uh, a very good uh, implementation here could, for example, be Akavash. That's something that I often use in this layer. I'm not going to show that here, but that's what we typically do here. On top of the repositories, we have a layer of services, data services, which are going to communicate, uh, or let's say, are going to be the consumer of the repository layer, that is your typical business layer. I also put here other services, things like uh, a dialogue service, for example, could go in there. Uh, typically, separation of concerns is very important for me. I put small pieces of functionality in separate classes here as well. That is something that goes in that other services block. And then on top of that, we have view models. Of course, we're building with MVVM, so we'll have view models. And you see MVVM cross there on the left, uh, well, MVVM cross is going to be used in those layers that you see, so it's going to be used from the view models and also from the services layer quite a bit. Of course, I have my models here. I'm going to show you a couple of those uh, things in just a minute. So all this code, there we go, so all this code is going to be shared. And on top of that, we of course built the, the actual applications still. So the three application heads, the iOS, the Android, and the Windows UWP application, which also will have references to MVVM Cross. So that's basically the application architecture. Well, let's dive in and take a look at some more detail for this. Now, the application, if you look at it from a, a solution perspective, has a couple of projects in there. The first one is a unit test project. We'll finish this presentation by looking at the unit tests. Then I have the mytrains.core uh, project, which is, as you can see there, a portable class library, and that is containing all the shared code. So all the services, the models and stuff like that, they go in there. Well, let's zoom in. Uh, this is actually a screenshot of the uh, solution explorer here. 
with the project open. It has uh, the model, the repositories, the services, the view models, and also two very important classes that I'll come to in the demo, the app and the app start classes. And so basically all this can be shared. Of course, keep in mind, view models as well, so we get a lot of code that we can actually share. Then I have the Droid and the iOS project, and I also have the uh, localization project, but I'm not gonna be able to talk about that with the short amount of time that we have together. Again, that is uh, also covered in the Pluralsight course. For the core project, I have used a PCL, a portable class library. Uh, I'm not a really a fan of shared projects myself. Um, I imagine doing it in the future with standard libraries, but for now, this is being done using a portable class library. Uh, I'm not a fan of shared projects. I'm not saying that this application cannot be built with shared projects. I prefer portable class libraries. I've been a fan of those uh, since they were created. Of course, the application's uh, shared code, so the core project, will require quite a few references. And quite logically, those are MVVM cross-references. So MVVM cross-references, uh, you can see them here highlighted. I'll show it in, in Visual Studio Live in just a second. Simply go to NuGet and you will find all the MVVM cross-packages that you will need. Um, there's quite a few that you actually need, and this one is actually built with a, a version which is quite a, a few uh, months old now, but uh, everything is still working pretty much in the same way. So, let us go to Visual Studio, <coughs> sorry, and let's take a look at uh, the solution. So, if we zoom in on the Solution Explorer here, uh, what we see here is that the test project, that's the unit test project. Then we have the core project, which um, has all the shared code in there. So, the, the view models, the services, the repositories, and uh, of course, also quite a few references, which are specific uh, for MVVM Cross. Then we have the Droid project and the iOS project, which of course have also references uh, to MVVM Cross, as you can see here, and also, of course, have a reference to the shared PCL, to the MyTrains.core. And as mentioned, the MyTrains.core is in fact a portable class library. So, that's the solution of the structure of the of the. Sorry, that's the structure of the solution. Let's go back to the slides for just a minute, and then we'll start diving in the code of the different layers. So, let's take a look at the core project. So, what is in there? Two very important classes are at the root, the app and the app start class. I think you can deduct from the name that they have to do with the setup of the class. Well, that's actually correct. I'll show those in the demo in just a minute. What else is in the shared in the core project? Model classes. My models are simply POCOs, uh, so plain old CLR objects, which have no base class whatsoever. I think they have a base uh, model uh, class in there, but I mean, there's no real reference to some, uh, some, uh, some uh, framework uh, library in there. It's just a plain, a plain POCO. I also often... Um, request that my teams build the applications with a client-side model, meaning that I do a mapping to a client-side model within my application. I don't always use a direct mapping with what I'm getting in, in JSON and I deserialize that into something I use, no. I let it stop in uh, at a very low layer and I will use a client-side model typically. That does require some mapping sometimes, but it actually makes my application more independent from changes in the backend. So a POCO, very simple, uh, some properties as you can see here. On top of that, we have the repository layer, as mentioned, that is actually my data retrieval. This is the code that is going to go out to the service and download some JSON, deserialize it into model instances. Probably in real life applications, there will be some mapping that needs to be done into the model that I'm using in my application. That depends on the application's complexity. It's an asynchronous interface and it's CRUD based typically. The get, the put, the delete and stuff like that is in there. Um, and typically with a repository layer, um, my classes in there are concerned with one single model. That's typically the mapping that I have. That is also the reason why on top of it, I will have my services layer. What you see here is a sample repository uh, notice that there is an interface on there. I will talk about the IOC requirements in just a second, but that has to do with uh, the IOC. That I, that's the reason that I put up there uh, an interface. It's, a, it's an asynchronous interface, as you can see. It has an async task in innumerable of saved journeys, and that is going to be part of the saved journey repository in this case. So nothing really special going on, I think, here. That's my repository layer. On top of my repository layer, I have my services layer. And my services layer is basically uh, the consumer of my repository layer. 
In some occasions, like in this application, it's just a pass-through. But it can, of course, have more logic applied to it as well. It's very well possible that you will have a service per unit of functionality, meaning that it could be that a single service, a single data service, is going to have to communicate with different repositories, with multiple repositories. That is very well possible. It will apply some business rules, and again, it also will have an interface applied on it, again, with IOC in mind, and I'll show you that in just a second. So a service in my, in my application, like I said, has an interface applied on it and also has an asynchronous um, uh, interface, so an asynchronous uh, task which is going to be returned here to get uh, all cities. Now, this of course needs to have a repository reference. I'm going to show you that in just a second. So, let's start by taking a look at this already in Visual Studio. So, the models, I don't think there's a lot of uh, effort that we need to put in there. So, the models are just plain poker classes, for example, city here, and like I said, I have a base model here, but there's nothing in there, so this is just a plain poker class that I'm using. That is the client-side model. Optionally, I have to map my, my, my responses from the service uh, into this model that I'm using throughout my application. That is going to, or the models are going to be uh, returned by the repository. For example, if we have this, if we take a look at the city repository, as mentioned, has an interface, and in this case has hard-coded data. It's a demo I do often at conferences, and you don't always have a reliable network, so that's why we're using hard-coded data here. Um, there is, however, if you take a look at the code, there is a base repository in there, which has some basic uh, uh, client, uh, HTTP client communication in there. I'm using the HTTP client, which is coming from the system net um, a NuGet package, the Microsoft net a NuGet package, which is uh, allowing me to pass the string that I want to uh, download the data from, and I'm deserializing that using JSON.NET into uh, objects of my POCO, so my model uh, layer. What we have uh, down here at the bottom is, like I mentioned, an asynchronous uh, task-based interface, which is going to, in this case, return my cities uh, and city by ID. This repository is going to be consumed by my services layer. And in the services, we have the data services, as you can see here. No, now you can see it. So the data services, as well as general services. Let's first take a look at the data services. For example, the city data service is going to work with a city repository, has itself an interface applied on it, and in this case, like I said, is just a pass-through, but could be doing some more business logic on top of the, of the data that is being returned from the repository. All right. So that is basically already the services layer. Now, this is using an iCity repository. How is it getting in that iCity repository? Well, that's a very good question. Let's go back here. And so I have already mentioned that one of the key functionalities of the MVVM cross framework is that it comes with IOC built in. It has it actually is built itself on top of an IOC framework and it uses or it allows us to use uh, the IOC framework that comes with it. Um, I think by now everyone is, is familiar with IOC. Yeah? It's basically the central location for um, the dependency store and, and the dependency retrieval. And it's very handy when, of course, we want to be doing unit testing. You'll see that at the end when we look at the unit tests that we can actually uh, benefit from the IOC container at that point. And like I said, it's built into MVVM Cross. Um, there's a couple of ways that we can, or a couple of things that we can do with the built-in uh, MV, uh, IOC container. Um, we can actually work with the uh, built-in MVC, uh, sorry, MVVM cross uh, IOC container through the MVX class. The MVX class is a very large class, and it, among others, gives us access to working with that IOC container. And that's what you see here. For example, I can register a singleton, meaning that I will always work with the same instance throughout the run of the lifetime of my application. Through the MVX, register singleton. I pass the interface, and then I say what needs to be returned, in this case, a single new city data service. I can then also later on, from wherever I want within my application, ask MVX to resolve the iCity data service, and that will return me this city data service instance. That is how MV, uh, MVVM Cross allows us to work with IOC. Um, it also supports um, uh, um, sorry, um, constructor injection, that's the word I was looking for. As you see here, I'm using the iUser repository in my iUser data service, and that is going to be plugged in through constructor injection. So the MVVM cross 
uh, ISC container also supports constructor injection. Now, there's one other thing that it does, and it allows us to actually plug um, platform specifics into the shared code as well. So imagine that you have some, um, some, some feature that you want to work with from shared code, but it is platform specific. How can you do that? Well, to the IOC container, you can actually, from your platform, IO, uh, sorry, your platform specific code, so the Android or the iOS project, plug functionality into the shared code through this IOC container as well. And we'll see that near the end when we look at plugins. So let me show you how I use the MVVM cross IOC container. So let's go back here. Um, there is a couple of places where I'm actually using it. For example, here, you're actually seeing uh, an application of the IOC container. I'm using um, the iCity repository, and I'm not newing that up. On the contrary, I'm allowing it to be plugged in through IOC, uh, sorry, through constructor injection. Uh, otherwise, I would create a tight dependency between my city data service and my city repository. I'm not doing that here. I'm injecting it through IOC, um, through the IOC container, through constructor injection. Now, why am I doing all these registrations? Well, remember that I said that there's two very important classes here, the app and the app start, and we haven't spent time looking at these yet. So let's do that now. Let's first take a look at the app class. In the app class, so the, the, sorry, the app class has a couple of very important things. It, it's a class which needs to inherit from MVX application. Why? Because the MVVM cross framework will search for your class that, in, that inherits from MVX application. And when it finds it, it will automatically invoke this initialized method on it. Now, typically, your IOC needs to be created at, or your container needs to be created at the very beginning of your application. So the initialized method is a good place because you'll see later that it gets invoked very early in the cycle. In here, I'm creating or I'm setting up my IOC container. I'm using a couple of things here that's called creatable types. It's actually going to uh, mass register with the IOC container everything it can find in my assembly that ends with repository. And it's going to use for that the interfaces, and I'm also going to pass register as lazy singleton, meaning that all the classes it can find that end with repository are going to be registered by their interface and it's going to register them using a lazy singleton, only created when it's, re uh, when it's needed the first time. And I'm doing the same with my services. So I've mass registered all my uh, dependencies, in this case, with my container. The line below is actually doing a specific registration here that has to do with the translations, but I'm not going to go in there because I'm, I don't have time to specify how the translations are done. The last line there is actually calling register app start, passing in a new app start, which is also going to be invoked automatically. But let's park that for now because I'm going to come back in this one in just a second. So you are, I've already seen how we do registration, and you've already partly seen how we actually use uh, the, the constructor injection here to use the IOC container that comes with MVVM cross. It doesn't stop there. It also is used in the view models. Now, before we take a look at the view models, let's jump back to the slides for just a minute, and then we'll take a look at uh, the view models in detail. So view models, huh? probably the most important link that we haven't talked about yet. What do they do? Well, like I mentioned, they expose state as well as operations. Well, state is just data, properties that I'm going to be binding my UI to. Operations are commands. Let's take a look at some code. Like I said, um, a view model in an MVVM cross application needs to inherit from the, uh, a base class called MVX view model. What MVVM Cross will do at the application launch, it will search your assemblies for classes that inherit from MVX view model, and it will register those as view models. Later on, when you build the view, it will actually search that list of registered view models for the view model that it needs. That's how it actually works. Um, in this case, the state of my view model, of my journey detail view model, is uh, a selected journey, which is simply a property that I'm going to be data binding to. I, have a <coughs> sorry, I also have this race property changed uh, call here, in, uh, so when the, the, the value of selected journey is set, so that my view model will race and it uh, will cause the data binding in the UI to update the, the UI automatically for us. That's the state. The second part is the command. Like I said, a command is 
also something that comes from MVVM cross. It's called the MVX command. And um, so typically in the constructor, for example, you can do this and you can register the code that needs to execute when the command is going to be invoked. And so the command basically, well, let's say it wraps all the functionality that we are going to invoke when the command is being, uh, being triggered. So I can register this, for example, to a button tap in the UI. So when I, the user taps the button in the UI, well, then the code within this command, so this part here, will be invoked at a later time. That's basically what the command pattern is all about. And of course, uh, notice that it, it, uh, the command implementation is specific to MVVM cross. It's an MVX command that I'm using here. Now, like I said, the view model does two things, state and operations. And actually, it does also a third thing. The view model, let's say, is, is, is like the, more or less like a controller in MVC in your application. And a controller is also, um, um, also has to take care of the flow of the application. For example, when I tap on a button, I may need to navigate to another screen or I may need to show a dialogue. Those things are flow of the application. And what you see here is that navigation and flow will also be code that we are writing inside of our view model. Now, MVVM Cross has a very handy method called show view model in the shared code. So think about it. This, the navigation is all done in the shared code. My view model, a is going to say, now we need to navigate to view model B. And we can do that by calling show view model. MVVM cross is actually using something called a view model first approach. A view model first approach is saying that we are navigating to a view model and then the framework somehow needs to magically find the view that is uh, linked to that view model. That will become clear when we look at the Android application. But do keep in mind that all the code that you see now is in the shared block. And that is all um, being reused across the different platforms. And it is this code that is going to make sure that we can navigate to a different screen. Uh, show view model is flow of the application. And the same, for example, goes if you want to invoke a dialogue. That too is going to be code that is shared. And that's how we typically reach a, a lot of code sharing, a higher code sharing uh, percentage when we apply uh, MVVM in our Xamarin applications. Well, let me show you this in, this, in the demo. <clears throat> so, let's go back here and well, let us now dive into the view model folder. Um, I'm going to open, well, let's take a look at the journey detail view model. So, this is a class, like I said, um, it has to inherit from MVX base view, uh, MVX view model. Um, I'm inheriting here from base view model, which is a class uh, that I've created myself that inherits from MVX view model. That's, that's the, the main um, um, condition to become a view model for MVVM cross. In here, I'm not going to show you everything, but do keep in mind there's two a very important calls that I've put in here called reload data async as well as a virtual initialize async. And the reload data async is going to call the initialize async. It's virtual, it doesn't have an implementation here. I'm going to add it in the actual implementation. So let's go to the journey detail view model. As mentioned, what does it do? It exposes state, the selected journey, and it exposes commands. For example, this one is a very simple one, the close command. When we tapped on that close button, it popped the screen of the stack. That's what I'm doing here. I'm initializing the command to actually invoke close this, which is going to pop the current screen of the stack when the user is going to invoke this command. We'll see later how it's being invoked. We also have the add to save journeys command, which is actually a more complex implementation. It is going to use the journey data service and a dialogue service. Hmm. How is it actually going to get access to these? The journey data service is then going to do stuff with the data. Uh, we've, we've already seen that. But take a look at the constructor here. As you can see here in the constructor, you actually can see that this is again accepting quite a few constructor parameters. I journey data service, safe journey data service, and so on. So these are again through IOC being plugged into my view models. That's what we see here. <clears throat> Automatically, because of MVVM cross, this code here is going to be invoked when this view model is is actually going to be invoked. When I act somehow say that this view model is going to be running, well, then the start method is going to be invoked. In here, I'm calling the reload data async, and the reload data async, in turn, 
is going to call initialize async. That was the one which was virtual here, but in my actual implementation, I'm using the journey data service to get the journey details of the passed in journey ID, and that's how I specify the selected journey to get its value. Right? So that's how my state is actually built up in my view model. Now, this is actually all the shared code. Um, we now have view models, we have communicating view models because we can actually perhaps navigate, we'll see more on that in just a second, but we haven't really seen how, well, we can actually build the Android and the iOS application on top of it. Well, let's change that. So all this up until now was shared code. Well, what I'm now going to show you is the Android application. Well, the Android application is in fact just a plain Android application, nothing special going on there, apart from, again, a couple of references that I'll need to add. So if you look at the application structure, there's really nothing uh, special going on, it's just a plain Android application, uh, and it of course has a reference to the core project, and it will have a couple of references to MVVM Cross, optionally to MVVM Cross plugins, as well as typically also some Xamarin Android support packages, but that is not really specific to the MVVM cross. Um, all right, so the Xamarin Android application knows about the shared, the core project, but um, how do we actually then start the, the, the whole chain of, of execution? Well, basically you have two projects, your Xamarin Android application and your core project. The Xamarin Android application is still the thing that is going to be starting. Although it is MVVM Cross, nothing special is going on here. It is your Xamarin Android application, which is starting as if it were a regular Android application. It is, in fact, just a regular Android application. In fact, that Android application uh, has a specific class called Setup. I'm going to show you that class Setup in just a second. Actually, we need to build it. It's a class that inherits from a base class, and that class is going to call into the core project. Remember, in the core project, we had that app class, and I specified that there was a method in there called initialize. When I instantiate the app, initialize is going to be called by the framework. That triggers the setup of the IOC container and also called that register app start, that last line that went into that app start. I'll show it in just a second. And there is some code that I haven't shown you yet that is going to call which, is, which, needs, uh, which view model needs to be shown by default. And that's how actually my view models are going to be started. We don't have views yet, we'll add that in just a second. But at this point, we'll be able to see how the first view model is going to appear on screen. Well, instead of showing it here, let me go to the demo so, um, in the Android application, which is, like I said, just a plain Android application, I have a couple of um, very important things to show you. The first is this setup class here. And like I said, the setup class is a class that we need to add ourselves, um, and it needs to inherit from MVX Android setup. Uh, so when MVVM cross detects this, it will call this uh, class here. And in there, it will automatically invoke the create app, uh, the first method that you see here, and this is going to call into the core app. That was the one that I showed you earlier, the one that inherits from MVX application, that sets up the IOC container, uh, or registers everything in the IOC container more specifically, and then calls register app start. And there, to that one, I actually pass a new app start. And that new app start is then very importantly um, going to have start method. Again, that start method is invoked automatically by the framework and it has that last line there, show view model. That show view model call is actually my call to specify which should be the first view model of my application. And at this point, well, everything starts rolling because I've specified which view model should be the first view model that my application is going to navigate to. In this case, it's called main view model. That's the first view model that my application is going to show. Now, I'm still missing something because I'm showing here, I'm gonna be able to show main view model, but how does it know which view is associated with that view model? It doesn't know that at this point. Well, for that, of course, we need to specify which view goes with which view model. And for that, we have again MVVM Cross that is giving us some help there. Well, how does it do that? Well, basically, MVVM Cross can work with plain Xamarin Android like 
like just any other uh, Xamarin Android application, so we can use uh, views, uh, sorry, activities, as well as fragments. Now, in my application, I've used fragments, but like I said, you can use uh, plain activities uh, in, in exactly the same way. Um, what you see here is one of the fragments of my application that um, has an MVX fragment as its base class, and notice that I specified as the type parameter here the view model that this fragment is going to be visualizing. And that's how it actually makes up the entire application's structure. Because here I'm registering that this particular fragment is the visualization for this view model. So whenever in the shared code I now ask show view model, show uh, journey detail view model, Xamarin uh, MVVM Cross is going to know that this is the visualization for that particular view model. So when I call show view model with this one, it's going to show this particular screen. On my, in my application. And that's how it actually makes up which, views it needs, uh, which uh, view it needs to search for in my application. As you can see, in the sh view code, there's really not a lot going on. Well, the only thing that it does here is actually inflating the view that we want to inflate. This is actually the Xamarin uh, Android view that I want to invoke. Well, let me show you that uh, in the sample. So let's take a look at the view codes. Um, so let's go over here and let's go to views. Um, for example, the uh, well, let's take a look at the journey details uh, fragment. Huh? So what do we have? We have a fragment, just a plain fragment. Of course, it needs to inherit from MVX fragment. We're still running with MVVM cross. And we pass to it the view model that this is going to visualize. In this case, journey detail view model is the view model that this fragment can visualize. Of course, if you would register multiple views for the same view model, MVVM cross is going to crash because it's going to say, well, you have specified multiple views for this particular view model. I can't decide for you. You can only have a one-on-one uh, -on -one relation between your view models and your views. In this case, this one is the visualization for the journey detail view model. And if you look at the, at the code for the rest in this, in this screen, well, there's really not a lot going on. I'm inflating a particular view, the journey details view. Well, let's take a look at that one. So in the uh, resources uh, layout, we have a view called journey details view. That's this one. So in here, that is plain Android XML. What I now have here is the ability to data bind. To what am I data binding? Well, to my journey detail view model. For example, well, let's take this one over here. This is a text view that is going to uh, display the departure time. And as you can see here through, uh, the MVX bind attribute that I'm using here, I'm specifying that this text view is going to get its text value from the selected journey dot departure time. So if we go and take a look at the journey detail view model, well, that is uh, this particular selected journey dot uh, departure time, that's a property over here, that I'm going to be visualizing over here in my Android XML code. And I'm doing, I'm passing here a converter as well to actually convert the time into a, a more readable format, in this case, uh, just the time part. And also, down here at the bottom somewhere over here, uh, the view model exposed state and operations. Well, the operations were commands. I'm also capable of binding, for example, in this case, a button. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm binding it to, I'm binding its click event, let's say, to a command in my view model, in this case, through the MVX bind uh, attribute again. I specify that the add to saved journeys command should be invoked on my view model, and that was the one we had here at the top. And so that is how everything is actually linked together. We have the view models, they have to inherit from MVX uh, view model, they are searched by MVVM cross. MVVM cross also knows which view is used to visualize which view model. And when you call in your shared code show view model to this particular view model, it knows which view model it needs to get and it automatically will search for the corresponding view for you. That's how the entire circle is made up. I hope that's clear for you because that is actually how MVVM Cross uh, is, is doing its thing, right? Now, there's what we have about five, six minutes left. 
that's 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 great. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of things here. So the iOS part, of course, we don't have time to to look at that. Um, now, what else does MVVM Cross come with? Well. It has a very rich support for plugins. Uh, plugins, uh, like the name implies, is just extra functionality that I can plug into my applications through a very rich set of plugins. Just search uh, GitHub for, um, for uh, MVVM Cross plugins. There's a specific site on GitHub, a uh, specific repo for those uh, plugins, and they can basically uh, add extra functionality uh, for your application. They're just an extension point uh, for you. So there's a couple of uh, sample, a couple of possible plugins or existing plugins that you have. Well, in fact, when I was showing you the application earlier, we were in fact looking at a plugin. Remember that I could click on that uh, view side button. Well, that is actually using uh, a plugin that allows me to open the browser natively in the platform, but triggered from shared code. Well, let me show you that. So in the, um, in the core project, scroll all the way up, there is in the references, a reference to, um, over here, MVM, MVM cross plugins dot web browser. Now that web browser actually gives me the ability in my view model, that is my settings view model, to actually, uh, over here, use the, uh, the IMVX web browser task. That's a, 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 an interface that is added through the plugin. And that allows me to call show web page, passing in the page I want to do, uh, I want to show. But thinking of what is happening here, from shared code, I'm defining flow. I'm going to open the web browser in, uh, when this command is invoked. Now, opening the web browser is something which is very platform specific. I cannot do that from shared code. That is why I'm using in the shared code a plugin and the, extra f the, the actual functionality, let's say, is also added, is plugged into the core by another plugin, actually the same plugin, but the Android and the iOS specific implementations of that plugin. If you go here, you'll find that there is, in fact, uh, also a reference here to the MVVM uh, cross plugins web browser and web browser droid. The web browser droid contains the implementation of that iWeb browser task interface, but for Android specifically, so it will contain the code that knows how to open your Google Chrome browser on your Android phone or the, the, the web browser on your iPhone in the case of iOS, right? That's what plugins are all about. And like I said, there's quite a few plugins available uh, on uh, GitHub on the specific site there. And the last thing I want to show you is actually, um, can we, basically put this thing to test. Is this now built in a way that we can actually make sure that we can unit test uh, this, uh, this entire architecture? Well, well, let's take a look. So I have here in my uh, solution, and let me collapse everything quickly because there's way too many things open. So I have here the uh, MVVM Cross Core Unit Test Project, which contains, uh, well, quite logically, some unit tests. And I have unit tests for the different layers, um, but typically I, I suggest that you start by testing your unit, uh, so your, your view models, because it is now possible to test UI-related code, because we don't have UI uh, references, we can test our view models. What am I doing in here? Uh, I have a test, for example, called the load from cities correctly on my search journeys view model. So let's go to that view model, search journeys view model. That's this one. And that has a from cities property over here. And I want to test that they are loaded correctly. Now, if you look at the dependencies for this view model, it has a messenger. We haven't talked about the messenger, but yeah. Um, there's a city data service, a connection service, and a dialogue service. Well, for uh, working with the um, from cities, I only need an implementation for the city data service. That's what you see here. So I'm actually going through the use of the MockU framework, creating my own uh, city data service. And that's what I'm doing there. I'm not going to show you the implementation. Let me quickly show it. It's actually a very simple hard-coded implementation using the MockU framework that is going to return hard-coded, a uh, uh, couple of hard-coded cities, uh, three in this case. 
and that's the tree here. I'm using a mock implementation for the messenger, the connection service, and the dialogue service for my view model. And then I'm invoking my view model, and I'm passing to those the mock versions of all the dependencies, as well as the mock city data service. Then on there, I'm calling the load cities. That was this particular call here, the load cities, this one. And I want to make sure that my from cities have now been successfully initialized. So I can do that in my test over here by asserting that my search journey through models from cities property, uh, sorry, from cities count is actually equal to three. And that's how I've now been able to unit test my view models. And that should actually make our circle round because we've now been able to create unit tests on the code that is actually, uh, that was the, the burden, let's say, if we didn't use the MVVM pattern. So with that, we are exactly on time. That's great. So um, I want to finish by uh, hoping, uh, expressing my hope, let's say, that I've given you an overview of how we could actually build um, testable, maintainable applications uh, on a, in my opinion, a solid architecture with the MVVM cross framework. Um, it actually, of course, still improves on the amount of code that we can share. We can now share everything up until the view model, which is, of course, great. Uh, we, the, the, the actual view layer in the Xamarin Android and the Xamarin iOS applications is very thin, so there's not a lot of work to do. And, um, well, I hope that, that you like more or less uh, the way that I've set it up. Uh, if you want, uh, take a look at the code. Um, you can actually uh, download it for your own uh, needs. Maybe it can be your starting point to build uh, your own uh, Xamarin applications. If you have any questions or remarks, let me know. Uh, the, the fastest is uh, via Twitter, uh, and I'll give you an answer uh, very quickly via that one. And um, as I mentioned, if you're interested in knowing more about how this is done, I have it uh, in full in this Pluralsight course here. It's going very deep, uh, also in the iOS project, and it takes you about five hours. So if, you, if you're not tired of hearing me talk, well, this is what you should do this evening. Thanks for being here. I hope you had a fun day, and I hope to see you tomorrow as well. Thank you.